it. Uh, good morning. Um, welcome to the December edition of our policy research talk. I'd like to welcome our online audience, both on WebEx and YouTube. My name is Sergio Smucker, manager of the macroeconomics and growth team at the World Bank Research Department. I will be chairing the session today as our director, Dion Fidmer, is attending another meeting at this moment. Excuse me. Um, excuse me for the glitch. I will be chairing the session today as our director, Dio Fimmer, is attending another meeting at this moment. Dio will join us a bit later. Uh, apologies from him. The policy research talks provide an opportunity to present work coming out of the World Bank Research Department with the goal of sharing the findings with colleagues inside and outside the department and the World Bank. I will present you today to my colleague, Stephen Pennings, who is an economist in our macro and growth team. Steven joined us in 2014 after completing his PhD at NYU. Steven works on a variety of macro topics, including fiscal policy, economic growth, exchange rate pass-through, and monetary policy, which he has published in top journals. Steven will present his novel work on long-term growth, which is called the long-term growth model. This work encompasses a set of tools and papers to help stimulate future growth paths in developing countries. It has been applied in about 45 countries around the world and is free, freely downloadable for anyone to use, including people outside the World Bank. This model is designed to be simple, transparent, and easy to use. The work has been originally produced jointly with our colleague Norma and Loisa, who is also connecting and he has been developed in partnership with MTI and many other colleagues across the World Bank, including some colleagues that are connected as well. Stephen will be happy to answer questions from people who want to apply the tool in their own work. And of course, comments are welcome from people who can improve the tool. As our discussion today, we are grateful to have our long, long friend and colleague, Albert Sufak. Albert is the World Bank Chief Economist for Africa, Previously, he was a practice manager in the macroeconomics and fiscal management global practice and a leader of the World Bank community of practice for the management of natural resources friends. His main research interest is in the macro foundations of macroeconomics. Albert started at the World Bank as a young professional in 1997 in our own macro group, which we joined together as colleagues. Welcome back uh, to Derek Albert. It's a pleasure to have you with us again and we are looking forward to having your comments. Now, I will ask- Thank you very Stephen, much, Sergio. Now, I will ask Stephen to present for approximately 45 minutes, after which we will hear from Albert for about 10, 15 minutes. We will conclude the sessions with questions and answers from the audience. If you have questions, please use the raise hand option in WebEx or signal to me in the chat that you will have a question and we'll call you, uh, your name in turn. If you are following on YouTube, please submit your question via the chat function. As a reminder, we are recording this talk. Now, without further ado, over to you, Steven. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Sergio, for the introduction. I'll share my, uh, my screen. Okay, thank you to everybody uh, connected. So uh, both those inside the World Bank and those also outside the World Bank. Um, so as uh, Sergio mentioned today, I'm gonna talk about long-term growth in developing countries. And uh, these views are my own and not necessarily those of the World Bank. So, more specifically in this talk, I'm going to discuss the long-term growth model, that is a suite of papers and tools to simulate future long-term growth in developing countries. I'm going to have a brief motivation introduction, 
Then I'm going to discuss the basic version of the long-term growth model in part one, and then some extensions in part two. So our first question is, uh, why is economic growth important? Well, this almost doesn't need to be answered. Uh, it's, such a, it's such a fundamental point. So economic growth, by which I mean the increase in GDP per capita, is going to be a main driver of higher living standards and of economic development. So even for those people who prefer other measures, it's gonna be highly correlated with other measures of development like the Human Development Index or median incomes. And from a flip side, an absence of growth is gonna create other problems like debt crises, unemployment, or social unrest. From the perspective of our institution, sustaining in inclusive long-run growth is gonna be central to achieving the World Bank twin goals of ending extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity. That is the incomes of the bottom 40%. So, uh, Craig has a paper in 2006 that finds that uh, the vast majority of variation in poverty in extreme poverty rates, changes in extreme poverty rates is, exchange, is explained by changes in average incomes. And uh, Dollar et al. have a paper in 2015 that finds that the incomes of the bottom 40% move roughly one for one with average incomes. So, to illustrate the power of long run economic growth, Consider uh, three large countries or regions uh, with a pop population of greater than a billion people today. That is China, India, or Sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, Sub-Saharan Africa is, is very heterogeneous, but I'm just gonna discuss the, the average today. Now, go back 30 years. So uh, in the panel on the left-hand side, you can see that 30 years ago, uh, all of these regions had roughly similar uh, GDP per capita. And in fact, Sub-Saharan Africa was um, the richest of the three and China was the poorest. Then over the, over the next 30 years, of course, China has had very rapid economic growth, uh, averaging 8%, leading to a more than a tenfold increase in GDP per capita. Uh, India has also done very well um, with a 4% average growth rate and uh, more than uh, tripling of GDP per capita, and Sub-Saharan Africa has had more mixed performance. Uh, some lower growth in the 1990s and, and higher growth afterwards, and overall a 25% increase in incomes. <clears throat> so uh, economic growth is, of course, very important for poverty. So you can see that on the right-hand side chart here. So back in the early 90s, uh, China actually had the the highest rate of extreme poverty of the three. So that in all three uh, countries or regions, they were in the 50s or 60s, but China was actually the highest. And of course, over this period, this rapid economic growth has led to the uh, elimination of extreme poverty in China. India, it has fallen by more than half, and Sub-Saharan Africa has also made, um, made some progress. So that's the history. But policymakers in developing countries are really interested in the future. So uh, they want to grow at higher rates over the next 30 years rather than the past. So these, this is raises these questions, what growth rates are gonna be feasible and how can we achieve those growth goals? So to, uh, to answer these questions, I'm going to be discussing the long-term growth model. So long-term growth model is a spreadsheet-based toolkit and set of papers. Um, designed to, to answer these questions above. So unlike a lot of models, which are designed to be very sort of comprehensive, uh, that long-term growth model uh, is actually designed for simplicity, transparency, ease of use, and low data requirements. So it's something that really anyone can use. And unlike a lot of other tools, it's, it's designed with a long-term focus. So other, there's other tools at the bank and outside the bank like MF Mod or the Oxford Economic Model um, but those are more short-term focused. So the LTGM is a neoclassical type, solo swan type growth model. So in, in that model, savings and investment are gonna be key for growth, but also particularly in the long run, productivity, human capital demographics, and female labor force participation. The main, main model is gonna be um, quite simple, uh, but we're gonna have a number of extensions. Uh, to the basic model, such as TF, one that it tries to explain TFP growth, public investment, human capital, and natural resources. So 
what, what can we learn from the LTGM about growth? Well, here's five takeaways. So the first one is that uh, growth performances, growth constraints and opportunities are gonna be quite heterogeneous across countries. So it's gonna be very difficult to say that, you know, because country X, uh, you know, is gonna grow at a particular rate, country Y will also be able to grow at a particular rate or because country X needs to increase investment or, or do, you know, whatever, Country Y will also have to do that. So, so the um, the situation in the growth situation in different countries is quite heterogeneous, and that's why we have a model um, that can be applied to countries individually rather than applying blanket uh, statements. So, having said that, there are a few general takeaways that work in that apply in most situations. So, the first one is that investment-led growth strategies are going to be unsustainable uh, in the long run. So investment-led growth is very is very popular among policymakers. When policymakers want, to, when many policymakers want to boost growth, the first thing they often think about is is higher investment. And the reason for that is that growth rates are going to fall due to the diminishing marginal product of capital. And uh, the way to get around this problem is to have a broad-based growth strategy. So to supplement higher investment with other dro growth drivers like human capital productivity or, or labor force participation. Another takeaway is that it's hard to have high investment rates without savings rates. So if we have an investment led um, growth strategy, we also need to think about the saving that is gonna fund that. A fourth takeaway is that higher public investment uh, is gonna only yield a modest boost to growth rather than creating a growth miracle. So very often public investment is regarded uh, People make some strong claims about the effect of public investment on growth, uh, but in our model, uh, we don't find that. So we actually find that the boost to growth uh, from high public investment is going to be no larger in low income than high income countries and is transitory. Also because of this diminishing marginal product of capital. And um, we also find that the level of public invest investment efficiency actually has no effect on the impact of public investment on growth, assuming that it is constant. Final takeaway is that fast growth usually involves fast productivity growth, especially in the long run, but also in general. Uh, so human capital growth is going to be important too, but less so than TFP and also operates with a lag. So the long-term growth model has been applied in uh, many countries around 45 uh, in terms of growth work uh, across all different regions, uh, World Bank regions. Um, and also we've done training for government officials on how to use the tool uh, to produce their own growth simulations. The LTGM is developed as a, as a team, but developed by a team as a partnership between the research department and the macro trade and investment global practice. So I am um, one of the uh, co co-leaders of this project, um, but uh, also uh, Norman Loiza. Um, and there's, there's just thank you to many of those people who have been involved uh, with the development of the tool. We've received uh, financial support from the Korean Trust Fund and also feedback from dozens of country economists and uh, policymakers in developing countries on ways to, to improve the tool. And uh, I also want to mention that all the papers and toolkits can be freely downloaded at our website here, worldbank.org slash LTGM. So now I wanted to talk about some questions we're going to try and answer with the LTGM, and those questions we're also not going to try to answer. So the questions we are going to try to answer are first, what growth rates will occur, would occur if trends in growth fundamentals continue? So this is uh, so two things, this is a, a business as usual type analysis. And uh, second, it's a conditional analysis. So it's not necessarily saying that those growth fundamentals are going to occur, but suppose they did, what growth rates would we get? The second question is, what growth rates are feasible? How can, and, and the third question is, how can countries boost long-term growth, at least in terms of growth fundamentals? So the three questions we're not going to try to answer are, what uh, growth rates will occur? So this is a kind of forecasting question. 
And obviously it's gonna be very difficult to forecast long run growth over the next 30 years. Second question is what possible growth paths will we get in the short term? So the LTGM is the wrong kind of model to answer that question because it doesn't have a demand side. And the third question is what sort of specific policies uh, would boost growth? So should, should uh, country X deregulate their banking system? Should they lower the uh, tariff on particular on a particular product? Should they change this particular law? Should the, you know, etc. So we don't try to answer that uh, that question for two reasons. One is that the answer, the effect of those of those policies often depends on the country context. And so what's going to be important for one country may not be important for another or may have different effects on growth. The second one is that it's even difficult to make general comments because of lack of exogenous variation in, in policies. So policy changes are often correlated with each other and other factors, and so it's difficult to isolate their, their effect on growth. Of course, policymakers do want to know the effect of their policies on, uh, on growth. So for the LTGM, we break this, um, break this problem down into two parts. So the first one is going to be from policies to solo growth fundamentals. So solo growth by solo growth fundamentals, I mean things that are close to growth, like investment, um, human capital, uh, labor force participation, TFP, productivity, etc. And then the second part is from these solo growth fundamentals to growth. So this first step is something that is that we sort of rely on country specific analysis, trends, micro studies, judgment done by country economists or counterparts who are very familiar with the country specific uh, conditions and constraints. And of course, we can bring in other country specific information and, and research. So like, for example, a lot of firm level product, firm level analysis, uh, you know, by my colleague, uh, Roberto Patel. Um, but what the LTGM tries to do is to look at the second uh, connection between uh, solo growth fundamentals and growth. So it does a kind of a future growth accounting exercise by connecting these proximate determinants of growth to growth, approximate determinants like investment, productivity, et cetera. So the goal here is to try and use the minimum amount of theory required, uh, which makes the relationship more robust. So there's going to be many, many different uh, growth models that might connect policies to growth in different ways. Um, but even though those different models may have different effects of these policies on solo growth fundamentals, often the effect of solo growth fundamentals on growth uh, is going to be common across the models. So this is going to make our analysis more robust. And uh, also modeling, a modeling approach is important because it forces it to, us to be explicit about our assumptions, the mechanisms that play, and also the dynamics. And dynamics are particularly important for growth. So I've now finished the uh, introduction, and now I'm going to talk um, about, the, about part one, which is the long-term growth model, uh, the basic version. So I'm going to discuss, uh, provide an overview of the model, some common results, describe how to use the model in practice, the effect of growth on poverty, and also uh, an application to uh, long-run growth in Cambodia. So the basic long-term growth model is extremely simple, and there's really only three building blocks, so I think it's worth discussing those one by one. The first one is a production function, so a standard Cobb-Douglas production function, where GDP on the left-hand side here is going to depend on A, which is total factor productivity, so that depends on the level of technology of the economy, as well as its, its general level of efficiency. It's going to depend on K, which is the uh, physical capital stock, so those are equipment, machinery, buildings, uh, highways, etc. It's also going to depend on L, which is the labor supply of the economy, the number of workers, and H, which is the human capital per worker, usually depending on the years of schooling of the workforce. Second, we're going to have to trace the um, capital accumulation over time. So capital uh, next period, period year T plus one, is going to be equal to capital, uh, the capital stock today, less some depreciation, plus new physical investment. 
And finally, we have to keep track of some demographic and labor market variables. So GDP per capita can be expressed as GDP per worker with some adjustments for participation rate and also demographic factors such as the working age to total population ratio. So one can take a simple rearrangement of the uh, equations on the previous slide to get some expressions for growth. The GDP growth on the left-hand side is gonna depend on total factor productivity growth, coefficient beta, which is gonna be between zero and one. Usually this is the labor share, which is usually gonna be something like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. It's going to depend on growth in human capital, demographic factors, labor force participation, and also the investment share of GDP. And this term multiplying the investment share of GDP is going to be the uh, marginal product of capital. So straight away from this equation, one can see some common policy messages come out. And this first po common policy message is that investment led growth by itself is not going to be sustainable in the long term. So why is that? Well, suppose that a country is going to have very high rates of investment, but very little other growth drivers. Um, so what's going to happen is that the capital stock here is going to increase faster than output. And so this capital to output ratio is going to increase over time. This is going to lead to a fall in the marginal product of capital due to diminishing returns. And it's going to mean that each extra unit of investment is going to add less to growth than the previous one. Uh, and as a result, the investment led growth rate will fall over time. Well, what can we do about this? Well, investment needs to be accompanied by other growth sources. So human capital, total factor productivity growth, labor force participation, et cetera, as part of a broad based growth strategy. And the idea here is um, that these different, that these other growth uh, factors are going to increase output much, uh, and but not have much effect on capital. And so that's going to prevent this capital to output ratio from rising over time, which is going to help maintain the productivity of, uh, of investment. A second thing that often comes out of the applications of the model is how we're going to fund investment. So the government may have a strategy to boost investment, but where is that funding going to come from? So uh, investment as a matter of an identity, investment is going to be equal to savings plus the current account deficit. And if we have a simplified version of the balance of payments, uh, which is appropriate for many developing countries, um, this current account balance uh, is going to be depend on foreign direct investment and also changes in external debt. So if we want to boost investment, um, but we don't want to have a big increase in debt, we need to either increase savings or attract more FDI. So it's interesting that when you look across countries, um, actually investment rates and savings rates are going to be very highly correlated. Um, so we have this plot shows investment rates on the y-axis and savings rates on the, on the x-axis. And for open economies, this positive relationship is known as the Felsing-Horioka puzzle. So how do we use the basic LTGM in practice? Well, there's really only three steps. The first one is to calibrate the model. So because it's such a simple model, there are really only three variables that need to be calibrated. First one is the labor share. Uh, labor share of, of income. The second one is the depreciation rate. And the third one is the initial capital to output ratio. And increases in all of these three generally make fast growth more difficult. Second, we need to choose a baseline. So we need to choose future paths of these growth drivers, these solo fundamentals um, over the next 30 years. So TFP, human capital demographics, which we can take from UN uh, sources using trends in the country or, or peer countries. And we also need to calibrate a path for investment. So for example, what we might do is we might say, okay, over the last decade, uh, investment has been around 20% of GDP. So we're going to assume that that trend is gonna continue. Investment is gonna to continue to be 20% of GDP. And this is gonna generate a business as usual baseline path for growth, GDP per capita and levels and also poverty rates. So when we apply the model in practice, we often find this business as usual growth path is um, not as positive as policymakers would hope. 
So the next discussion is usually to have some scenarios to try to boost growth. So we can change growth drivers, TFP, human capital investment, et cetera, and see but that is based on sort of reasonable values, based on the country's history or maybe peer countries, and to see how growth and poverty respond. Some other exercises, which I'm going to skip over. So I mentioned on the previous slide that growth, um, that we also track, that we also look at the effect on, on poverty. And of course, policymakers are really interested in, in how their growth plans are going to affect poverty rates. But usually this is really complicated because the poverty rate depends on the whole income distribution. And so you need micro data to simulate poverty. So we do kind of a trick, which is to use a log normal approximation of the income distribution um, instead. And so instead of requiring the whole income data on the whole income distribution, it only requires two data points, an initial poverty rate and a Gini coefficient of income inequality. And according to a paper by uh, Lopez and Servan, this actually works pretty well for, for most countries. So if we have an unchanged Gini coefficient, then a 5% uh, growth per capita is gonna increase all incomes by 5%. So you can see that in this picture uh, to the right-hand side, uh, where we're gonna move from this red curve here to this yellow curve here. This distribution just shifts to the right. So what effect is this gonna have on poverty? Is it gonna be big or is it gonna be small? Well, it's gonna depend on two things. Um, the first one is gonna be how many people live near the poverty line. So uh, you can see in this red income distribution, there's a big mass of people who live right next to the poverty line. And so uh, a, a given increase in incomes is gonna to lead to a big reduction in poverty. This yellow income distribution, relatively fewer people live right next to the poverty line. So the same increase in incomes would lead to less change in poverty. The second thing is, of course, is gonna be the income distribution. So if the income distribution, other things equal is more, other things constant is gonna be more equal, that is a lower Gini coefficient, there's gonna be a larger effect of growth on poverty. So I've now discussed uh, the model sort of conceptually, and I, now I wanna talk about an application. And this application is uh, long run growth in Cambodia. This is an exercise we did uh, joint with the, uh, the uh, MTI team in, um, in Cambodia in 2018 and also the government of Cambodia. So the context is that uh, GDP per capita uh, in Cambodia at that time had been growing strongly over the last few years, around 5%. Um, and Cambodia is, of course, surrounded by countries that have a very robust growth performance. So they're right next to Vietnam, they're close to China, uh, and a number of Southeast Asian countries are just to the south. So naturally, the Cambodian government had very ambitious growth goals. So at that time, Cambodia had just become a lower middle income country. And they so they set these growth goals of becoming an upper middle income country, which is about $4,000 per capita by 2030, and a high income country, that's about 12,000 per capita by 2050. So we wanted to know, are these growth goals um, realistic or, or not realistic? And also how could we possibly achieve them? What, what sort of policies or, or, um, or areas of focus do we need to achieve these, these targets? So the first step to answering those questions is what rates of growth are gonna be achieved under current trends? That is a business as usual type analysis. So we calibrated the solo fundamentals that are part of the long-term growth model to historical averages. So for example, investment as a share of GDP had been 20 to 22% in recent years. And so we assumed that was gonna continue in the future. And we did a similar thing for human capital, TFP growth, et cetera. And then we ran the model. So we found that even though baseline growth was actually very rapid and, and very impressive in, the, in an absolute sense, um, the growth path was gonna fall short of these very ambitious growth targets. So you can see that on the, on the figure on the right-hand side. So this figure on the right-hand side starts in 2018 when we, when we did the analysis, runs to 2050. And uh, this is the level of GDP per capita. This is a log scale here um, on the y-axis. And are these, um, these solid line and dotted line are two alternative uh, business as usual uh, baseline. So one, a default one, and one that's a little bit more conservative. And these dots here 
represent these, these diamonds here represent the growth uh, targets. And, and as you can see, those, um, those growth targets are, um, are both going to be missed in the business as usual um, baseline. Okay, so what can we do about this? What growth rates are going to be feasible and how could we possibly achieve these growth goals? Well, human capital and TFP growth we had assumed in the baseline were already quite fast and maintaining that pace was going to be challenging. So we didn't want to uh, change those change those at all. Um, but when we looked at some peer countries, particularly in the past, they did have higher rates of investment than Cambodia. So um, one of those countries was uh, South Korea. And so we ran a, a scenario where an investing like, like Korea scenario, where uh, we would increase the investment share of GDP to 33%, uh, which I should say is actually a very ambitious target. Um, and we also considered one investing like Malaysia, so a 28% of GDP target. So from our, our previous discussion, one should automatically uh, be able to see some challenges that come out of this uh, these scenarios. So the first one is that high investment, of course, is going to become less effective over time in boosting growth due to a lower marginal product of capital. So it is true that uh, Cambodia did have very broad-based growth, and so that um, made this less of a problem than in some other countries. But uh, it was always, it's always going to be the case that there is a diminishing marginal product of capital. The second thing is um, how to fund uh, investment. So when you look at these peer countries like uh, Korea and Malaysia in the past, when they were at similar levels of, of development as what Cambodia might, might take, um, they had actually quite high savings rates, approaching 30% of GDP. Whereas in Cambodia, this was going to be something like 10 to 15% of GDP. The other problem, of course, which is outside the long-term growth model, is that really high rates of investment could overheat the economy. So what did the model say about, about the growth path? Well, we simulated the, the model. This is, these are the results with an um, investing like Korea um, investment path. Um, and uh, the first, and so, so this is the baseline here uh, in solid line, and then the dotted line here is going to be this Korean growth um, growth path. So um, one can see that uh, that by 2030, even though growth was very was very fast, and we had quite optimistic assumptions. It was difficult to reach this this target, and so. Um, so we sort of suggested in the report, maybe the government like, might like to consider a, a less ambitious 2030 target, or perhaps just focus on sustaining growth and avoiding, avoiding imbalances. Second thing uh, that the model showed was that this 2050 target was possible, um, but only with much higher uh, long run investment and savings. So this was sort of opened up a discussion um, about what reforms might work in the country context to achieve those goals. So, uh, for example, reforms around financial sector development or uh, improving the business environment. Okay, so I've now discussed the, finished discussing the basic long-term growth model, and now I'm going to discuss some extensions. So the basic model is, of course, very simple. Um, so we wanted to extend the model in various ways. And there are four extensions I'm going to discuss. And each of these can be characterized as taking part of the production function and providing some extra detail. We're trying to unpack that variable a little bit. So there's one, uh, the first one is a TFP extension. So let's try to discuss TFP here. Another one about public capital, human capital, and also natural resources. We add an extra sector. So the first extension is uh, the TFP extension. Um, so this is based on a paper by Kim and, and uh, Loisa in 2019. So uh, as I mentioned um, on the takeaway slide, TFP growth is, is one of the most important determinants of long-term growth. Um, it's very difficult to grow fast without fast TFP growth. And over the long-term, growth mostly is TFP growth. The problem, the problem with this is the TFP growth is a residual. So uh, TFP growth is calculated, uh, generally speaking, as um, GDP growth 
less growth in different factors of production, like uh, the capital stock, human capital, or, or labor import. So in a sense, uh, TFP is going to be often characterized as a measure of our ignorance about the determinants of growth. Of course, there's a lot of work to try to um, to try to, to to understand TFP growth. Um, and so Kim and Lisa is going to are going to make um, an important contribution in this area. So the way they uh, the way they approach this problem is first to, to do you to have a compre comprehensive literature review of the determinants of TFP growth. So they found five general determinants from their literature review. One was innovation, another one was education, market efficiency, infrastructure, and uh, institutions. And so what they did is they collected data on each of these five areas. They calculated the principal component. Uh, which is kind of like a common trend um, of each of these areas. And then they calculated the common trend uh, across uh, across all five areas to form a TFP determinant index. It's kind of like a weighted combination of the data in all these different areas. So then they ran a cross country regression to try to connect this determinant index to TFP growth. So this took the form of the average TFP growth over a five year period. Uh, based on the level of this, this determinant index, as well as some other factors. And they found that the higher, the higher this index, the faster TFP growth. So this enabled them to do some scenarios like the following one. So this in one scenario they considered in their paper was an increase, um, increasing the, um, the determinant index to the regional leader. Uh, so this is considered over a period of 15 years. So these are the different regions, and uh, these are the countries that would be the regional leader in terms of the index. And so they assume that all those run a scenario where all of these countries are going to increase their the index to the, the value of those countries. And so one can see uh, on the right hand side, this is going to lead to an increase in TFP growth on average for these different regions. So in um, East Asia and Pacific and Sub-Saharan Africa, it's going to be somewhere between um, 2 to 2.5%. Um, uh, in other regions, it's going to be a little bit lower. So then once we have this TFP growth path, we can feed it into the main long-term growth model to get a path for GDP growth. So uh, as I mentioned a few slides ago, um, TFP growth is going to boost GDP growth one for one in the short term. Um, but in the long term, it's going to lead to a, a larger increase in growth once we account for the uh, induced capital accumulation. So the second, um, the second extension that we have is one based on public capital. So this is based by based on a paper by myself and uh, Shamila Devadas of the um, Kuala Lumpur office at the time, and this came from discussions we had with various um, operational colleagues and also um, government counterparts when we were presenting the main long-term growth model. So those people would say, well, we presented the main long-term growth model with uh, aggregate capital stock, but what about public capital? So we often think of public capital as sort of essential infrastructure, roads, bridges, power, etc. And this is going to boost the productivity of other factors of production and lead to an especially big effect on growth. So to take account of this, we modified the production function to allow for a term for in infrastructure services. That's this S here. And you can see this S here sits right next to TFP and acts a little bit like TFP, increasing the productivity of those other factors of production. And these infrastructure services are going to uh, depend on the public capital stock uh, here, which is in, in red. So one of the important things to, to allow for when considering the effect of public capital on growth is the efficiency of this public investment. So anybody who's worked on public investment in, in developing countries know that there's a number of challenges. The first one is uh, corruption. So in many cases, um, you know, a, a public investment project of uh, $3 million, um, only $2 million ends up uh, investing 
actually in capital and then $1 million disappears. Um, the other problem, of course, um, is that public investment can be can be misspent, um, even if it's not corruption, but it can be allocated to inefficient projects or it can be uh, allocated to regions that uh, have some special privileges or po are politically important rather than being allocated to the most efficient projects. So it's important to take account of this. And so we, we did that by allowing this coefficient theta, which could be less than one. So um, it meant that if you, even if you, that if, if, if even if you have, for, for whatever dollar value of, of capital, uh, public capital you have, the efficient le level of public capital um, that actually enters in produ into production could be, could be less. So one interesting result that we, we found uh, in the model was that this level of efficiency actually has no effect on the impact of public investment on growth. So this comes out of our model, but it's not originally our result. It comes from a paper, an IMF working paper by Berg et al. Um, and it's a surprising result, but also very intuitive when you think about it uh, a little bit more. So this this expression is a simplified is a is a similar one to the one I had had before, where GDP growth uh, in a particular year is going to be equal to a bunch of different factors plus a term related to public investment. So this is public investment as a share of GDP multiplied by a term in brackets representing the marginal product of public investment. Um, so in green here you can see the efficiency terms. So uh, the investment, the public investment share of GDP is multiplied by the efficiency of new public investment. So this captures the fact that I, the effect that I mentioned before, that uh, you know if you if you have let's say a country that maybe has high rates of corruption, when you invest um, you know three million dollars, uh, you maybe only get two million dollars of public capital coming out the end. So naturally, this would reduce the effect of a given level of public investment. However, there is another factor, and uh, that is the marginal product of capital. So if we assume that this um, situation has always been the case in the country, um, then it means that the public capital stock is going to be much smaller than measured. So if you look at the books, maybe there's a, a public capital stock of say $300 billion, but in actual fact, there's really only $200 billion of useful public capital um, because of, let's say, past corruption or past misallocation of public capital. Um, so this is going to lead to an increase in the marginal product of capital. Or put in another way, because um, the public capital stock is smaller than measured, there's going to be a greater need for new public capital. So as one can see from this equation, when the efficiency of the new public capital and the efficiency of the old uh, capital, public capital stock are going to be the same, these two things are going to cancel out. And that's the result that the level of efficiency has no effect on the impact of public investment. So in the model, uh, we did some simulations of a 1% percentage point of GDP permanent increase in public investment. Um, and uh, rather than looking at individual countries, uh, we looked at we looked at different income groups. So uh, low income, lower middle income, upper middle income, and high income countries. So uh, this is plotted on the right hand side. We did a simulation starting in 2018, and assuming that those permanent increases in public investment rates uh, persisted for the next 30 years. So one can see that growth would increase by about point. 0.5 to 0.2 percentage points in the short term. That's excluding the multiplier effects. So these are effects on potential growth only. The other thing one can see is that this boost to growth is going to be temporary. So uh, the boost to growth is going to fall over time. After 30 years, it's going to be about 0 0.05 to 0.1 percentage points higher. And this is due to um, our old friend, the falling marginal product of public capital. So Combined, I would characterize these results that uh, higher public investment is going to be helpful for growth, but it's not going to create a growth miracle. So public capital across countries is typically something around 5% of GDP, maybe 10% of GDP, depending on the country. Um, so 
if you had, let's say, a five percentage point increase in public investment as a share of GDP, so that's a pretty big increase in public investment, maybe you would have potential growth that's one percentage point higher in the short term and half that in the long term. So that's going to be um, you know, important for growth, but it's not going to make this economy into a, a growth miracle. The other interesting thing from this plot is that there's actually no a uh, larger effect on low-income countries and high-income countries. Um, it's actually pretty similar across all different countries. Uh, and the, the reason for that is that the effect size depends on the uh, public capital to output ratio, rather than the shortage of public capital in absolute terms. So low-income countries obviously have an absolute shortage of public capital, but that's not the relevant measure for looking at the effect of 1% uh, of GDP increase in public investment. I should also mention these are averages or, or medians across um, countries. So one of the takeaways of the long-term growth model is that the effects on different countries are gonna be heterogeneous. Um, and we have a, the LTGM public capital toolkit, which can be applied country by country. So the third, uh, the third extension is one relating to human capital. Uh, so this is in, in, in beta version. So human capital, as I mentioned uh, a few slides ago, is gonna be the productivity of an average worker relative to unskilled workers due to the human capital of those workers. So for example, um, you know, workers might have higher years of, higher years of schooling, and so they, let's say this H is gonna be equal to three, so they're maybe three times as productive as average workers. And uh, typically in, in most models, including the basic LTGM, this is only based on the years of schooling of the um, of, the, um, of the workforce based on the MINSA return to education. So in the human capital extension, we're gonna make two changes to this. The first one is we're gonna use a broader human capital definition based on the uh, human capital index of the World Bank. So the most important adjustment is that instead of just looking at the years of schooling, we're gonna look at learning adjusted years of schooling. So this is an adjustment for quality. This is gonna be really important for many developing countries because many developing countries have made, um, have made a lot of progress on increasing the years of schooling, but the quality of those schools often are very low. Um, so it's important to adjust for quality. And the second one is gonna be some health measures. The second thing we're gonna do is we're going to um, trace human capital over time by population cohorts. Um, so, for example, if you consider a reform that would affect today's children, maybe increasing the quality of schooling, or that's so those children are not going to be in the labor force at the moment, hopefully. Um, and so, this is going to mean that the effect on the human capital of the workforce and GDP growth is going to be delayed until those children join the workforce. So, here's an example of an application uh, to Malaysia we did with this model. Um, so Malaysia was on, is on the verge of becoming a high income country. So they, they wanted to um, consider what would be the effect on growth of increasing um, their quality of education and also health indicators to the median of high income countries. So on the left hand side, we considered, this is the human capital of the workforce. We considered a immediate uh, increase, uh, change in policies that would lead to, um, to those um, higher education quality and, and health. And one can see that in the short term, uh, so, so look at the x-axis here running from 2020 to 2050, in the short term, this has no effect on human capital of the workforce because it's gonna mostly affect children. Um, and then of course, the effect on human capital of the workforce is gonna grow over time, um, as in the shaded area here, um, as those children, that are healthier and have higher education join the workforce. Um, and then on the right-hand panel, we trace the effect on economic growth. This is gonna to lead to a modest uh, boost in economic growth. So another interesting thing one can see from the Malaysia situation is that the quality of education has the largest effect here um, uh, relative to health. And this is related to the Malaysia situation, but also is a common result across countries that quality quantitatively has a big effect. So um, the final extension I'm gonna discuss is the uh, natural resource extension. So um, 
one of the comments we got from um, from counterparts is what about countries that are exporters of commodities? How we how can we adapt to the model? So what we do is we add a commodity sector here. Um, so I'm going to use the example of oil, but it could be any resource like copper or gold, for example. Um, so GDP is just going to be equal to non-resource GDP plus this commodity output. And we're going to model this commodity output uh, depending on the oil capital stock and the oil reserve. So if you have uh, bigger oil rigs, you can pump more oil. And also if you have more oil reserves, you can also pump more oil. Another important thing to take into account is that in resource rich economies, government revenue often depends very much on uh, those natural resources. And the government can do several things with those revenues. They can invest them in physical capital, they can spend them on other things, or they can save them abroad via some fiscal rule. So a couple of interesting results that come out of the, this extension are one, that uh, commodity price shocks are gonna have no di direct effect on real potential GDP. This is kind of um, a little bit surprising, but if you think about it a bit more, it's, a, it's, it's obvious as well. The reason is that real GDP is going to be a constant export price measure. Um, so, of course, commodity prices have no direct effect on it. And this model is a neoclassical model, so it doesn't consider the demand side. However, we are going to find there's going to be an effect on growth, um, but that's via the fiscal side. So, fiscal rules, we're going to find that uh, invest revenues in, uh, in public investment are going to have the fastest effect on growth, like, for example, Bartwick rules. Okay, so this is my conclusion slide. So I hope I've um, convinced you that uh, growth in developing countries is going to be really important for both increasing living standards and also achieving the World Bank twin goals. So to try to uh, understand growth, we're going to uh, we've built the long-term growth model, which is a simple and transparent toolkit and set of papers to simulate future growth paths in developing countries. It's based on the neoclassical solar swan growth model where savings, investment, TFP growth, human capital, demographics, and, and so forth are all important. And while the basic model is very simple, we have a number of extensions. And the next one we want to consider is incorporating climate change. And uh, there's five common takeaways from the model. Heterogeneity, uh, not sustain, unsustainable investment-led growth paths, uh, the necessary the need for high savings rates to accompany high investment, public, high rates of public investment don't, don't usually generate a growth miracle, though are helpful, and fast TFP growth is usually needed for growth. So that's the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you very much for, uh, for connecting. Um, and uh, I look forward to your questions and comments. Um, as I mentioned, the papers and toolkits can be freely, freely devote, downloaded at our website. And, um, and also feel free to write to me about the long-term growth model. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen, for the interesting presentation. While we uh, hear to Albert's uh, comments, I'll encourage you to post, raise your hands or post your questions in the chat function, and I will call your names after Albert in the order that we receive the questions, or so you're raising the hands, so you, we, you you can also um, make the questions uh, yourself and um, make comments to, to Stephen. Um, Albert, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sergio. Thank you, uh, Stephen, uh, for a very, very exhaustive and uh, detailed presentation. So um, I think this is a set of papers. So um, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Sergio and, and, and Dion for inviting me back. The, Norman inviting me back to, uh, to, 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 to deck macro. I feel like I'm in the family reunion here. Uh, Sergio, as he has mentioned, uh, Norman and I were all in that uh, macro uh, unit of deck uh, some time ago. So uh, uh, great to be back. So um, I also want to uh, congratulate deck for um, you know, developing a, a long-term uh, growth model. Um, you know, one thing I used to think uh, that differentiate the World Bank and the IMF, it's no longer true, I know, but one thing I used to think about these two institutions is um, when it comes to macroeconomic work, the World Bank distinguishes itself by two things. One is the long-term focus. 
And the second is the link between growth and poverty. So um, this model is clearly addressing these two things. And my sense is it's long overdue. And today with uh, all the institutions moving into that sphere as well, uh, it's important for the bank not only to have this kind of model, but to have one that really works, one that speaks to countries, including those I work for in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. So, um, first of all, uh, congratulations to ADEC for uh, developing this tool that's going to be extremely useful to economists in, in the bank. It's already uh, been used, but uh, I think it, it has room to, to grow. So as you heard, uh, this is a set of uh, studies, it's not one paper I'm commenting, it's a set of studies uh, uh, backed by a, uh, a model. So I'm going to be, uh, you know, I'm going to spend less time, you know, summarizing the findings. Stephen did a great job doing that, but I'll, I'll move into two categories of comments. One uh, category on, on, on the model itself and its extension, and then the second category of comments based on what I believe this kind of model should actually be uh, addressing, devoided of the uh, straight jacket of the uh, you know uh, solo uh, swan uh, model. So uh, let's let's let, let, you know let, let, let's take it uh, from that uh, angle. So you know the 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 the, the model that uh, Stephen uh, Norman and colleagues have developed is, is clearly um, <clears throat> an easy model it's simple uh, but I also I've also learned uh, throughout the years that in modeling uh, everything that is too simple is wrong but everything that is too complicated as well uh, is not usable so Question is, is this model with its extension going to find that right middle ground uh, that moves away from the uh, comfort of the neoclassical framework, but, but that we all know to be uh, very, very far from the reality of number of countries we work on. Um, so this is a welcome uh, uh, model and, uh, you know, and, and, and it, it's, it's basically, uh, Building on the simple Cobb Douglas function, measuring TFP uh, uh, savings and investment and human capital, those uh, account for the demographics. I'll come back to that issue later on. And, and extensions include public investment, human capital, and natural resources. And uh, it's welcome that one of the extensions is going to be addressing climate. I'll come back to that issue. So. What we, 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 we have here is, uh, you know, a model that suggests basically that the growth performance uh, constraints and, and opportunities are heterogeneous, which is absolutely important. Uh, Investment-led growth strategies similar to those that we have seen driving growth in uh, East Asia in the uh, 80s and 90s and, and more recently China. Uh, meant not to be sustainable, uh, and, and the model is uh, making that case quite quite clearly. And and you know, long run diminishing of uh, you know diminishing returns of, of of marginal product of capital definitely drives that result. So uh, one thing that is also important here is to. Uh, uh, to see one of the findings uh, pointing to inefficiency of public investment uh, attributed here mostly to corruption and, and you know, crowding out. Um, and and uh, this certainly calls for uh, more nuance, and I'll, and I'll come back to that later on. The study also estimates high investment uh, results in, in, in growth rates ranging between uh, or in 0 0.05 to 1 percentage point over 30 years. So this is not enough, that investment rate, and the study is quite clear about that. This is not enough investment uh, based growth strategies are not going to be enough uh, to reduce poverty in, in, in the developing world. And that's absolutely clear. So what are they suggesting? They suggest that public investment 
should follow a broad-based strategy which includes human capital, total factor productivity, labor participation, etc. So um, um, this is less uh, convincing uh, than than uh, the model itself. And you know, again, uh, Stephen has mentioned this in, in its presentation. Moving from the model to policy is going to be uh, one area uh, where more cautions is 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 needed. So, message is quite clear: investment alone will not be enough. So, um, question is, what really matters? What matters from this perspective is TFP, and and TFP can generate sustainable low growth from this model, estimated to 1.5 to two times, including effects on capital. So, um, the effect is a, a one to one over the short term, which is impressive. Um, uh, and, and with the extension, TFP seems to be the key driver of growth in the long run for emerging uh, markets and developing economies. So this result indicates that a shock to TFP boots economic growth uh, in South Korea uh, and, and South Africa by 2 to 2.5 percent over 15 years. So. TFP is constructed as an index derived from a principal component analysis with five key determinants. Uh, you know, this is coming from a work Kim and uh, Norman Reza did in 2019. And the determinants of TFP here are innovation, education, market efficiency, infrastructure, and institutions. So that's what I got going through all this uh, important and impressive body of, of literature. Now, let me come to a couple of uh, comments on, on the model itself. The first is, uh, uh, you know, the link between growth and poverty. In this model, what I see is, uh, you know, poverty rates and Gini coefficient, basically distribution of income being the only drivers of that relationship and that elasticity. Well, what we have noticed in a number of uh, low-income countries is that the relationship between growth and poverty also depends on the quality of growth, meaning what you invest in actually matters. What kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, what, what, uh, I, what, what areas or what level of structural change the economy needs is, is, is important if you are basically investing in uh, commodity uh, export that tends to be uh, very very low labor intensive that elasticity elasticity tend to be uh, you know smaller so um, it's not just the level of investment and level of the Gini coefficient I think there is a space here to really explore uh, the quality of growth in relation to poverty, and the link here is uh, is jobs. You know, if 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 growth is more likely to create jobs, then uh, the, the the link to poverty is is certainly uh, uh, stronger. So, um, question is, you know, how do you uh, see this being uh, addressed properly in this uh, framework? Uh, so that's that's one. The second is. Um, TFP. TFP determinants uh, uh, have been uh, uh, very, very <laughs> scant and, and, and uh, quite complex literature here. Uh, Norman and, and Kim have certainly, uh, you know, contributed to that literature. The question is, um, how do you assess innovation in low-income countries? Does innovation actually really matter? Or is it about adaptation or adoption of off the shelf, on the shelf technologies? Is innovation the right way to actually capture uh, TFP? Uh, is is the question. The second is uh, you know misallocations, and misallocations are not just market efficiencies. We we do have actually quite a significant. Uh, uh, level of misallocation of, of factors, uh, misallocation of talent, um, 
that is clearly uh, not necessarily linked to uh, market structure. Uh, Cesar Calderon in my office has done a whole uh, study on uh, misallocation, working with the Diego Restuccia, and I would definitely want to see how this uh, framework is actually accounting for misallocation, uh, you know, way beyond market efficiency. So um, the third uh, comment I have on the model is uh, more on the extension side as well. The neoclassical framework is simple. We all know it. We all study it. So very difficult to come back and quibble about, uh, you know, uh, human capital or GFP as residual. You know, we, we, we all know that, uh, that part of uh, our, our discipline. Let me probably look a little bit more into the extensions. What is interesting here is most of the extensions are, are coming up with uh, very controversial findings, which are absolutely logical when you take the uh, neoclassical lens but which probably do not make sense really when you look at the economies that some of us work on. So first is this uh, issue of um, commodities. <clears throat> the model, a pure perfect neoclassical model has no prices. So I'm really curious how this uh, result is interpreted as uh, commodity prices not being relevant for uh, long run uh, growth potential. I really want to hear a little bit to, 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 to understand how this uh, conclusion is, is, is drawn. And this is actually quite dangerous for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, you know, again, you're arguing for heterogeneity, yet this is a very uh, you know, broad brushing uh, conclusion that uh, may not uh, really uh, uh, address uh, you know, or, or explain you know, growth. Take Angola. You know, I really struggle to see how commodity prices would not affect, or oil prices, to be more specific, would not affect Angola's potential growth. Uh, you know, take Equatorial Guinea. I mean, I can give you a number of examples where these results completely fly in the face of uh, evidence. So, um, you know, that's, that's uh, on, on the commodity side. Um, second result that is pretty uh, controversial is the low impact of health. And coming right in the midst of a pandemic that has shown us clearly how uh, health can actually have all those, uh, you know, uh, connected effects or, uh, uh, you know, uh, knock on effects that would actually affect growth down the road, that, that result also comes uh, 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 or must be handled with care. And this not being uh, you know, a general equilibrium framework, I'm not expecting this to actually account for those uh, effects, you know, secondary effects of uh, health, uh, health uh, uh, you know, shock. Uh, we're not considering this, you, you know, effects on supply chains, as we all are seeing, and, and, and consequence on inflation that do affect poverty. All those are completely left out. So I'm here basically calling for a little bit of modesty when we interpret this kind of result. Um, the third is, is the result, and, and on commodities, uh, there's quite uh, ample evidence, actually, ample literature that uh, argues for the contrary. Uh, came across a paper by uh, Gopi, Gopina uh, in 2007, IMF paper that actually shows uh, that that actually uh, has a result that is completely uh, uh, opposed, you know, opposed to, to to the findings of this of this model on commodity prices and how they could affect uh, growth potential. Um, on public investment, uh, we do uh, you know I, I do share. Uh, the concern of the author on uh, the authors on on inefficiency, um, but but one thing that is quite uh, puzzling to me is uh, the level at which uh, countries are you know uh, level of development of countries uh, definitely uh, matters here. If you are uh, investing, you are running this model on Burundi, a country that has less than 15% of its uh, population with access to electricity. Um, you know, and, and given the link between electricity and output, 
just not sure how uh, you know investment in uh, uh, you know electricity public investment uh, because private investment in that context is extremely scarce uh, it's difficult to see how public investment in Burundi in electricity may not lead to a uh, better growth prospect so um, again I'm just uh, uh, you know Putting question marks here on on some of those findings and cautioning the authors on uh, generalization of, of of these results. Now, let me uh, switch, if I have two more minutes, to a couple of uh, points that I wish this model would tackle because I believe they are what factors that would actually uh, drive growth. I know. We straightjacketed straight it with the neoclassical framework, but if we could actually relax that framework, what are the things that really matter for long-run growth in Africa, for example? I see five, and this model basically accounts for only one. And that one that is accounted for is demographics. To me, those five megatrends are demographics. You have roughly between 12 and 15 million young Africans entering the labor market every year. And, and, and that needs to uh, actually uh, drive uh, any mod modeling that work that we do. The second mega trend, <clears throat> I know the D, is the digital. And I'm, I'm not sure how this model is actually accounting for uh, the impact or this, if this model can actually account for leapfrogging effects of uh, you know digital uh, digital investments that are certainly uh, not captured with your typical uh, uh, capital stock data. How do you actually account for digital investment that are already leading to countries like Kenya or Ghana or Nigeria to a significant expansion in the service sector that are certainly uh, you know, driving growth uh, and, and in, you know, increasingly driving growth. So, so that's two digital. The third is climate. I'm gr I'm glad uh, next extension is going to be on climate. But if you link climate to commodities that your uh, previous extension has addressed, uh, with with global decarbonization, there will be an impact on commodity export. It could be positive for those exporting what I call green minerals, those like DRC exporting, you know, cobalt exporting, uh, copper and others that would be necessary for the green uh, economy moving forward. But it could also be negative in terms of uh, fossil fuel exporters, you know, coming in the form of stranded assets. And that also is a real risk. So how do you see this playing, or as you do, as you get get into your extension on on climate, how do you account for those stranded assets, those uh, green minerals, as I call them? And third aspect on climate is uh, natural disasters. How do you uh, model the or investment that are going to be needed to adapt to climate change, but also to uh, repair the damage of climate change? And, and very likely those investments are going to be public. So linking to your extension on public investment. Fourth, uh, you know, fourth mega trend I see is uh, gender. And here, more, more importantly, girls' education. And, and this is probably the, the space to go back to your modeling and check on the human capital variables, not just quality of education. If where possible, it would be useful to actually, you know, uh, model the impact of girls' education because it has a huge impact on, uh, on, 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 on demographic trends. It has huge impact on labor force participation, which all uh, would uh, affect your model. So, um, so the, 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 the final uh, mega trend is conflict, and conflict, as we see, really expanding across. The, the Sahel, for example, but also in the Horn of Africa, um, you know, how does conflict actually impact, uh, you know, long run growth is certainly something that we have to be able to understand better. So I've uh, 
certainly gone through, uh, uh, you know, all my comments here for now. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, this is, this is uh, useful for, for you and for your team as you continue this very, very important task. So thank you very much. And again, congratulations to that for really initiating and pushing this work. Uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albert, for those uh, wonderful comments. Uh, very useful. Before going to some of the questions that are already appearing, I would like to give uh, Stephen a couple of minutes to respond to Albert, if you wish. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Albert, for those <clears throat> those uh, comments and a, a nice mix of of kind words and and areas where we should improve as well, um, which is always uh, which is always good. So, um, you know, you raise so many points that, uh, you know, I think it would be difficult for me to discuss all of them now, but a couple of them I did want to, uh, to respond to. So one of them, which was a, a point of clarification is on the natural resource extension. Um, and this is something that I think I sort of raced through a little bit at the end, uh, but should have been clearer. So the natural resource extension, so the point about the natural resource extension and the effect of commodity prices is that, they do have an effect on growth, um, on potential growth, but just that that effect is not a direct effect, but it's rather depends mostly on the government's fiscal response. So, um, so that's the point that we wanted to that we wanted to make. Um, so we didn't want to say that so that there's you know no effect on long run growth. Obviously, there is an effect, but just that effect mostly works through the government's fiscal response. Um, rather than through other channels. And um, another comment I wanted to make is sort of a more, a more general comment is that um, is on the use of the model. So the model, models need to be used uh, carefully and applied to answer the right kind of questions. Um, and so I think that the thing is that, um, you know, the, mo the world is infinitely complex. complex and uh, and so you raise a lot of areas that the model, of course, doesn't cover, and that's that's completely true. And so that um, so, you know, the way we see it is that the model needs to be used with some judgment. So the the people applying the model need to take out those insights from the model, but also to to adjust for those areas where the model has oversimplified reality. And those simplifications are really important. Um, so on the invest, the final thing I wanted to mention is on the um, uh, long run growth uh, in in East Asia. So we actually do did have a a, a working paper by a um, on on long run growth in Korea um, using a, a model very similar to the long to the long term growth model. And the results of that uh, were that um, actually growth in Korea, even though there was very high investment rates. Uh, was actually quite broad based. So TFP growth in Korea historically was actually very strong, as was human capital. And the growth drivers varied a little bit over time, um, but it, it, it sort of was uh, broad based. So I don't see those as being the East Asian experience as being um, inconsistent with the model. Um, so uh, there's obviously a lot of other areas, but I might leave those to a future discussion. Also on Angola, we 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 uh, we actually have an application for Angola, which I can share with you of the natural resource extension. So I'm with that. I, I would just like to thank you very much for those comments, um, combination of praise and criticism, and uh, and uh, just to leave more comment time for other uh, comments and questions. Um. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, there are at least uh, three questions, uh, three people that have um, raised um, issues. So I would give them time to speak out and then uh, you can respond to the, the three questions together. So first, Daniel Reyes, uh, would you like to pose your question? In the, the question, if Daniel is not available, the question that um, he raises whether you can discuss the assumptions embedded in using the cop douglas production function, particularly the, the implication of assuming costs are retail to scale, and why not use a more general production function like the CES? 
And the other question that he has is, has a team considered creating a database of growth potential across countries using the long-term growth model? This would, be, this would be very useful for us country economies working on debt sustainability assessment, particularly for countries in high risk um, of debt distress. Um, but before I say those questions, let me also uh, give the opportunity to, to Ahmad Hassan that has raised his hands. Ahmad. Thank you. Uh, first of all, really, I would like to congratulate Stephen Norman, who I last met in my mission to Kuala Lumpur several years ago. Uh, but this very good and useful work. And, uh, and I have been in part of World Bank uh, growth teams uh, working very closely with the IMF. Uh, it seems to me that it's, it's a major breakthrough in the World Bank's work on this area uh, you know, in a long while. And I really appreciate this. Uh, uh, so let me, and I, I stumbled across this uh, a couple of months ago, attending another tech seminar, uh, but I uh, just accidentally came across this and I, this needs much more uh, publicity and news, I think. And let me just quickly say that I think to some extent, uh, you know, it is being undersold. I mean, I take, uh, I take the point what Albert is making, but you know, we have to work with workhorses. Uh, models are always you know uh, limited uh, by definition and, and we have to be, all all models have to be used with judgment and including this one so that said i think there's a lot of useful you know policy discussions which can be you know evoked from here from the uh, from discussion as we have already done in the case of cambodia but very specifically it'll be uh, this can be a good tool to guide policymakers around various issues so i'm very glad the training has been provided uh, it, some some quick points on uh, the extensions. One important element of growth is structural transformation. You know, resources move out of agriculture to manufacturing, higher productivity areas. You know, how are you capturing that trend? You are implicitly in this model. I can see a lot of things are there implicitly. It's there. So let me just sort of highlight that point. And I think Albert's point on employment is very well taken. You have it uh, again, again contained in. Um, uh, no, please, uh, if you can be brief about your specific okay, question, right. because okay. I have others uh, that want to speak out as well. Okay, well, very good. Thank you. And I will. The two first is uh, about things like, for instance, education having only a long term effect, not a short term effect. You can amend that easily, but I think so by uh, the idea of TVET. China put 50% of its uh, of its uh, people to the TVAT stream. Germany does many of them, right? So the question is, the short-term impact can come in faster if you include ideas like that. Let me let me just say the public investment, both the uh, the, the result and the message is disturbing. Again, I'm completely agreeing with Albert. In a, in a lower-income country, if a government invests in a poor or does not invest in a poor can make all the difference between long-term growth prospects. So you know, I, I was I was a bit surprised whether you were, uh, you know, you know. I mean, I I I, I couldn't really follow, you know, why uh, that shouldn't have an impact. I mean, effectively, it means that if public investment is inefficient, the investment rates are halved. So your investment does matter for long-term growth. In solar model, it slow down, but. Uh, you know, it the public investment efficiency has to matter because uh, the level of investment well, is. Uh, th um, thank you very much. Yeah. Let, let, let me ask, uh, give um, uh, still the, the chance to oh, respond to thank these you. Uh, useful questions and then uh, the other ones by Daniel Reyes. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, for the questions. Um, so the first uh, question was, why not use the CES production function? Um, I think the, there's two reasons for that. One is that um, the Cobb Douglas uh, adds, the, the first one is the Cobb Douglas is a lot simpler. And the second one is that it fits growth data reasonably well. Um, and then the other concern is if you had CES, how would you calibrate that elasticity? Um, and if you calibrate it incorrectly, you can have all sorts of crazy implications for growth. Um, if you, for example, assume a very high elasticity of substitution between labor and capital, effectively, you just can grow by having high rates of investment forever. And that's all you need to do. Um, alternatively, if you have a very low one, you um, you end up having like a Haradoma model. And there's all sorts of um, 
all sorts of very unusual predictions of that model. Um, so another one is a database on potential growth for debt sustainability analysis. That is an excellent idea. And uh, that's something we should, uh, we should work towards. And uh, I'd be happy to discuss that, um, that bilaterally or with, with other people. Um, on the second set of, um, of, uh, of, of questions, um, which is related to, uh, to public investment and also structural transformation, um, and employment. So, uh, so structural transformation is something that would be, um, uh, it would be incorporated mostly in TFP. Um, and, uh, you're right. That's something we could, we could incorporate in a bit more detail. And we have started to do some work in that area, but, uh, the, the challenge of course, is keeping the model simple while, uh, while trying to capture those other factors. Um, Technical education is another interesting area, and I agree that that is something which, um, you know, could be added to the model and is particularly important for, for countries. Uh, and there's a shorter lag for technical education between the, uh, the inputs and uh, the effect on GDP. Um, the final question was a point on infrastructure and infrastructure being absolutely critical for, uh, for growth. So there's actually a big literature. Um, it's quite a mixed literature, but what that literature does, does not find is that public inf public investment always leads to faster growth. It's generally a mixed result. And even on electrification, which is one of the points that Albert mentioned earlier, it's a paper by, um, by uh, Ted Miguel and, and various co-authors that finds very mixed results of the, or of, of electrification. Uh, in, ter in terms of improving economic outcomes. Um, and that could be because, uh, you know, countries have multiple uh, constraints. And so, you know, you maybe you build a big port, but then there's no road or the, there's no uh, rail line or the firms that are there cannot take advantage of the port or, um, you know, there's all sorts of other multiple problems. And those are the reasons why you know, in the history, there's there's very few cases where you know there's just one constraint, and all you need to do is build a big port, and all of a sudden you have amazing economic growth. Um, I might I might leave it at that, but thank you very much for those comments. Thank you, Stephen. Um, well, let's take advantage of the fact that we have Norman uh, before he leaves. If he wants to say a word before leaving. Thank you, Sergio. Well, first uh, I want to say that. Uh, Stephen has been the, the perfect teammate on this uh, on this task, on this massive project, and I'm very very grateful for everything that he has done. And we have we have a, a number of people who have worked very actively on this project, and, and to all of them we are grateful. Uh, Albert, wonderful comments. Thank you very much. I, if we can, they come all from a from a place. Uh, of a person who is dealing with the policymakers on these very important issues, and we appreciated the feedback and all the rest as well. I just want to say that some of the issues that you have raised, uh, especially dealing with efficiency and with productivity, they can be addressed in the context of the model as well. And uh, we have tried to do that in our papers dealing with uh, both uh, the pu public um, investment and, um, and TFP. Uh, when we say that, for instance, efficiency, efficiency uh, by itself, uh, or the level of it, does not inc increase growth, we are not saying that uh, improvements in efficiency, or growth in efficiency, or growth in total factor of productivity, and all the things that are involved would not have an effect on growth. In fact, they will have an important effect. But uh, what we need to may maybe change the perspective that when we talk about growth, it's about dynamics. It's about changes and it's about improvements. And that's what in the end matters for, uh, for outcomes. And with this, I need to leave. I have, a, I'm terribly sorry, but uh, thank you very much, Sergio, for the opportunity to say a few words. And thanks again to everyone. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's 11.30. There are a couple of other questions in the chat, but uh, they can be raised bilaterally with uh, Stephen. Stephen, if you want to remind us how to get in touch with you, if uh, people are interested in extensions and work uh, on the long-term growth model for their own countries.
Yes, thank you. Um, yes, please, please send me an email. I'll be very interested in your in your comments. And I think my contact details are on the um, uh, the the event page, and uh, as well as um, our, our long term growth website www.worldbank.org/ltgm. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for participating. Uh, it was a great talk, uh, great interactions, great comment from Albert. I wish you, everybody, happy holidays, happy new year, and see you in 2022 with another policy research talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.